What up, Ken folk? This is your boy, the Do Rag Gamer in the house, and we're back with another installment of Gaming Archaeology, where we dig deep into gaming's past and dig up some relics. Now, if you've been with me in the past, then the name Data East is going to be familiar to you. Most notably, if you've seen my unboxing videos for the Super Retrocade, as well as the ad game stuff. Now, what was Data East? They were an arcade manufacturer that was active between the mid 70s and the mid 90s. Now, they're not as famous as, say, Namco or Capcom, but they did put out some pretty cool titles. There's John Mack, Burger Time, Heavy Barrel, Lock and Chase, even the more underrated stuff such as um, Cliffhanger, which is un it which is completely unrelated to the Sylvester Stallone flick. But they would ultimately declare bankruptcy in 2003. Even though after that, a company called GMO would obtain most of their assets and there would be a ton of re-releases of many of their games and um, you would see many of their intellectual properties out of different places like the um, Nintendo Switch, the aforementioned plug and play stuff, and of course devices like this. Um, this is the My Arcade Mini Player and it has, um, it has 34 Data East titles on it. So, we're going to unbox this thing today, but first we're going to take a deep dive into the history of Data East to see what they were, where they came from, and their impact on the gaming industry. But before that, I want you to make sure you click like and hit subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, because I got more on the way and you're going to want to check them out. So let's get started. While Data East may not be as well known as other classic gaming developers, say Capcom, Konami, or Taito, they do hold a significant place in the hearts of many retro gamers. From the late 70s until the mid 90s, Data East supplied arcades and consoles with dozens of fun games. Joe and Mac, Burger Time, and The Avengers are just a few games that they are known for. While financial mishaps may have doomed them as a company, they managed to live on thanks to gaming emulation, licensing deals, and a new resurgent retro gaming collectible market. Data East was founded in 1976 by Tokai University alumni Tetsuo Fukuda. The company first began as an electronic engineering company. Among their first game-related products was the Deco Cassette System. The idea was that arcade owners could install a different game by changing the inner tape without having to swap out the entire cabinet. In theory, this could solve the problem of arcade machine turnover expenses. Instead of changing the entire cabinet, one could simply buy a base cabinet and change the inner cassette when they wanted to replace the game. However, the problem was that the tapes were often unreliable, taking a long time to load and becoming worn out quickly. Although Data East would abandon these products, they would serve as the precursor for other arcade systems with a similar design pattern, most notably SNK's MVS platform, later known as the Neo Geo, which launched almost 10 years later. Like many other Japanese game companies, Data East would establish a US division in 1979, entering the console gaming market shortly thereafter. Throughout the next decade, the company would produce many of its most popular titles, such as Karate Champ, Karnov, Heavy Barrel, and Bad Dudes. They would also produce ports of these games for systems such as the NES, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis. They would even produce software for the Neo Geo, including the cult classic frisbee title, Windjammers. The company would also license and manufacture games from other developers, including Capcom and Irene. Three developers from Data East would split off from the company to form the developer Technos, best known for the Kunio Kun franchise, along with Double Dragon. One of the company's more infamous titles was a 1993 fighting game called Fighter's History. As one of the many fighting games released during the early 90s fighting game boom period, there was not much particularly special about the game. However, it was the subject of a lawsuit from Capcom. Capcom alleged that the game copied certain elements from its more popular Street Fighter 2. However, Capcom would lose the lawsuit due to the judge ruling that game mechanics cannot be copyrighted. 
In addition, Data East would also argue that the original Street Fighter had borrowed mechanics from Data East's own Karate Champ, which was widely regarded as the first one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Thus, one could make a case that Data East was no more guilty of copying than Capcom was. Ironically, Data East itself had filed a lawsuit against Epix Incorporated years earlier over the 1986 game World Karate Championship, which Epic published in the US as International Karate, or IK for short. Data East alleged that Epix had been guilty of trademark and copyright infringement, accusing them of copying elements of the aforementioned Karate Champ. While initially the courts ruled in favor of Data East, meaning that Epix would have to recall all copies of IK, Epix would later appeal the decision. This time, the courts would rule in their favor, ruling that the similar elements between the two games were all common ideas, such as a two-player option, a scoring system, and various moves. Therefore, they could not be copyrighted, and while both games had similar gameplay and themes, there were enough differences between the two that consumers would have no trouble distinguishing between the two games. Furthermore, while the games were similar in common elements, the ideas behind both were to portray the sport of karate, and one can't copyright an idea, otherwise Data East would hold a monopoly over an entire sport's gaming rights. Like Capcom's lawsuit against the company years later, the courts ruled that look and feel cannot be copyrighted, only intellectual property. If either one of these lawsuits had gone differently, one can see how problematic that would be for the gaming industry. The company would also produce a line of pinball games by way of a pinball division that it purchased from Stern Electronics. Whereas companies such as Williams created machines that were based on original concepts, Data East would often create pinball machines based on licensed properties, such as the WWF, Batman, and Celebrity Aaron Spelling. While these machines were appealing to the public, they would be somewhat costly as the licensing fees were expensive. Furthermore, the arcade and pinball scene was experiencing a bit of a downturn throughout the 90s. Sadly, Data East would slowly die out from the mid-90s to the early 2000s due to financial difficulties. 1994 would see the company's U.S. branch, along with its pinball division, sold off to Sega as part of a debt settlement. In 1999, Sega would then sell the pinball division to Gary Stern, who had been running the subdivision since Data East obtained it back in 1986. Gary would later rename it Stern Pinball since it had previously been a part of Stern Electronics back when his family owned it. With the USA branch having been liquidated at some point during the 90s, the company would withdraw from arcade distribution in 1998. For the next few years, Data East would fall back to an earlier strategy, sales of electronic equipment, until finally declaring bankruptcy in 2003. The company's final game would be a 1996 PlayStation and Saturn port the MSDOS first-person shooter DEFCON 5, which was a far cry from the platformers, shooters, and action titles that defined the company's glory years. Fortunately, while Data East may be gone, the company survives in a way, as many of its assets, including the name, were bought by Japanese mobile gaming company GMO. Several of Data East's individual franchises, such as the Jake Hunter Mystery Games, were similarly picked up by companies such as Arc Systems Works. In addition, many classic Data East titles, such as Bad Dudes and Sly Spy, are available on the Nintendo Switch under the Johnny Turbo's arcade label. Finally, retro gaming companies such as Retrobit, My Arcade, and At Games have created several handheld and plug-and-play devices that feature Data East titles. While Data East may be long gone, the amount of options for gamers to experience their legacy is endless. Whether you grew up gaming, if you're new to the hobby, or want to show your kids the classics, Data East will always be a huge name when it comes to retro gaming.
So one thing I wanted to mention about Data East that I really couldn't fit within the history section because I really couldn't find a lot of information about was that as an electronics engineering company, they produced a number of devices outside of gaming, one of which was a fax machine called the Data Fax, which was, which as they said, was one of the first world's first portable fax machines. Also, they produced a, a um, they produced cell phone equipment for, for Japanese satellite phones. And um, the years before its bankruptcy, they produced a series of negative ion generators. Of course, I couldn't really find, I really couldn't find any information on um, on these things. So, um, so that's why I didn't mention that in the video. So, anyway, now that we're back, let's take a look at this thing. This is the Data East Classics um, player from my arcade, and um, if you've seen the store, you've seen those. Um, you're probably familiar with those um, really big mini arcade machines. Now, the last time I played a Data East device that was affiliated with my arcade, it was that handheld device that advertised the arcade versions of the Data East titles, but in actuality, ended up being the Nintendo version. Now, um, now I imagine that that won't be the case this time around. So, but we're still going to take a look. Now, one, now I know this is a pretty older device, but like at the, at the time when it first came out, it was like eighty bucks. But um, by the time I got it, it was on clearance for like fifty dollars. So this isn't something that I would spend the whole eighty dollars for, and um, eighty dollars for. So um, let's check and make sure if it's worth what I paid for it. Alright, so I got myself, I got the box, we got the scissors, so I know it's a bit of a mess, it's kind of hard to see, but I'm going to turn it around a bit. Alright. Let's cut through the tape up here. Alright. So one thing about my arcade stuff is that it got some pretty nice packaging of nothing else. Because that Diddy's machine I had mentioned, um, it had a bunch of filler games, but the packaging was pretty cool. Now obviously Marvel's Avengers is going to be on here for copyright reasons. So here's a big white box now. Alright, so here's what's on the inside. Well, kind of hard to see, obviously, but. Guess we can't allow to drop it. But here is the arcade unit itself. Take a look inside. Huh, not bad. We take a look here, then here's your little coin machine plus start button. Oh, that presses into it. I guess that would be how to turn it on. Now here's what else is inside the box. Um, Huh. 
So I got an instruction manual. Changing the display layout. Some tips on how to change the display layout. And here is the and here is the uh, cable, the AC cable. Sorry to step up from the Daisy's portable um, because the last my arcade device didn't have a plug-in or a or even a battery, so we're gonna have to duck out and get some batteries. So now we're going to plug this in. We're gonna see how it plays. Let's turn over here a bit. All right, now we're back. I know it's a bit of a mess again, but <laughs> but you know that's how it is. I got, oh, we got so much room here. But here is the startup screen. These classics G mode, and you'll notice that's the. Uh, Joystick. Wait a minute, let me make sure I got that in the frame. It's gonna be pretty hard to. Got a karate champ, side pocket, caveman, ninja, shootout, super burger time, midnight resistance, lock and chase, burger time, pro bowling, pro soccer, pro tennis. Rootin' too. So a lot of these games on here were um, were originally released during the Deco system, and they would um, and they produced like non-Deco versions and dope in uh, like standalone versions, like with the game actually built in, and those versions would obviously be more popular. Because like I said, like the deck like with the uh, Deco versions, um, the problem. The problem was they um, they would oftentimes wear out easily. So let's see what one of these games look like. I'm just really looking at bad dudes, making sure it's start. These lights in my G mode. I have an ninja roid and grime. I'm wondering where's the volume on here. Oh, here it is on the back. It's kind of like Android. So let me show you the back real quick. So there's a headphone jack and there's the volume buttons. See how we do get the arcade version this time. Let's see how it plays. I really can't play today myself right now because and hold the camera, but yeah, it's pretty much the arcade version. So definitely a nice. Here's Dark Seal. It's like an RPG beat up hybrid. So yeah, I don't do much more on it because like 
Now, I don't think this thing has like anything like save states or anything like that, but for what's worth, you do get unlimited coinage. So, that's it for the, so, um, well, I'm not sure if I would pay full price for it, and I'm not, and I'm not sure you would. Um, this definitely looks well put together, and um, there's a huge amount of games for um, Ford Selection 34. Um, you'll bound, like with most of these things, you're bound to find something that you like on here. Um, but once again, the biggest the biggest caveat about it is like the price, 80 bucks. So you're definitely gonna want to wait and see till it, like if you can find it on clearance or maybe you can find it on eBay used or something like that. But um, if you got a desk or at home, then this is definitely good. Um, this is definitely a good addition if you're a classic gaming fan. So that's pretty much it. Um, this is gaming archaeology. Once again, make sure you click like and hit subscribe so you can see more content. So I got more coming up on the way this year because we're because I am definitely going to come up. And I got some more stuff coming that you're gonna want. Also, make sure you check out my Twitch channel, also Screwface the Bone, to see um, the CB do live streams. I try to do one at least once a week. So make sure you follow me on Twitter because that's the easy way to know when to do things. So anyway, um, that's it. The first gaming video of 2020, and we have a great year. Peace out.